Hi, and welcome to the October edition of the Hartford Sports Report. I'm Larry Dukes and my partner, Tony Lombardi. This month, we're going to cover the Josh Hammer Memorial Baseball Tournament. We're doing a Hartford County Sports Roundup at midseason, and we're going to cover the Bob Brown Running Series and much more. Tony. We'll also sit down with a guy you remember from WMAR-TV, someone you know now as the co-host of the Afternoon Drive Time on 105.7 The Fan and Harford County resident, Scott Garceau. But before we get to those things, we're going to start with an interview with a head football coach for the Bel Air Bobcats. Welcome back to the Hartford Sports Report. I'm Tony Lombardi. I'm here with Dave Uerk from Bell Hara High School Bobcat Football Program. Dave, how are you today? Do, doing well. Tell us a little bit about Bobcat football these days and your experiences here and how long you've been a coach here at Bell Air High School. Yeah, um, I've been the head coach here for nine years. Um, and w one of the things that we, we talk about coaching wise, our, our you know, mantra or we, we look to do, our mission statement is to positively affect young men and build relationships through the game of football. So uh, that is like the, the message that we start with our you know, uh, parent meeting with and all of our talks with our kids with it when they enter into the program. And then we, you know, a lot of people are perturbed about the fact that winning isn't part of that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, we look to build into a winning process by doing the right thing constantly. So uh, that, that tends to be the, the way that we approach the game and also how we approach uh, other things that happen within the school building because it is the, the student athlete mantra of how things, things go. We, we deal with a lot more than just uh, simply Friday night and football games and right. doing that. Now I've met you through the Bud Bitzer Foundation before with that Ravens Nest One manages and operates. Now, one of the things that always comes through during the interviews and the essays that the kids have to fill out when you nominate them for the Bud Bitcher Award is they're always talking about how football teaches them about life, and that's kind of what you're speaking about. Yeah. You know, they, they talk about the adversity of an injury, a setback, and how they overcome those adversities, because that's really like life. Yes, no, absolutely. In, in fact, um, it's something that I, I don't advertise very often is uh, I wasn't a football player. I, I actually played collegiate soccer. I was a very, very good soccer the player other at one point. Yes, <laughs> at, at one point in time in my life. Um, and if I had it all to do over again, like I said, I played in college. I was all regional. I, I played for the Olympic Development Program team. I would go back and play football because it's, it's different. The, the unity that you get from guys when they go into what is a controlled fight and the, the friendships and the bonds that you make I, I believe are different. That's one of the reasons I used to be a soccer coach. Why is it different than soccer and the other sports? Um, I, th I think because there isn't that physicality of the, the, the thought process of getting injured. Um, yeah, you get hurt in soccer and it is a physical game, but the fact that there is such a unified effort in you know, a five to six second span where everybody has to do exactly what they're told to do or make the right decision at that particular time. And you're counting on the guy next to you way more than you would be in a soccer match. There's a whole lot of decisions happening, but they're not a unified decision. They're right. not, it's not a everybody on the same page at the same time. And if we're not, we're going to get lit up. Kind of reminds me of Bill Belichick. He always says, do your job. Yeah, yeah, Everybody absolutely. does their job. Everything's going to work out just fine. Yeah, you, know, you hope so. Yeah, now. Right. <laughs> so let, on... let's talk about the team, the Bobcat team. How, how are they looking this year? What are your expectations for 2018? Uh, well, coming into the year, again, we're, we're about uh, you know five weeks in right now. Well, for us, four, because we, we lost a game due to weather and that kind of stuff. Um, we, we are right now sitting at one and three. Um, and when you hear that, you know, a lot of people would be, holy cow, that's that's not a good program at all. Um, 
we played three state level contenders uh, in CH Flowers from PG County, uh, 4A school, much bigger population than us. And we had them down to, you know, we had five minutes left and they drove to score to beat us. We were winning 13 to 12 and they ended up beating us 20 to 13. Uh, we played John Carroll, crosstown rival, mm -hmm. you know, MIA school, uh, and we didn't put our best best foot forward that night, and they handled us pretty well. Not, not saying they're not a good team, because they definitely are. Um, and we also had some untimely injuries that kind of have hurt us into it. And then Havita Grace, who every single year is right around the state playoffs as well. Those are the three teams we've lost to. Um, so you're battle testing now, we, you're ready we to are, go. I'm, I'm telling you right now, is anybody that looks at our record and says, oh, Bel Air's not a good program, come play us. And you'll, you'll know that you played somebody when, we'll when the game's the over. We'll see the Bobcat fangs coming yeah, out. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Let's talk about some of the players. Who are some players that our viewers might want to focus in on when they're watching Bel Air Bobcat football? And talk about if they have potential to be student athletes at the collegiate level. Uh, well, uh, overall, again, with, with that mantra of team first and things like that, you know, that we, I believe we have a lot of guys that are are putting everything into it to, to be as best as they possibly can for our program. If we're talking about guys that are moving on and have showed interest in, in uh, you know, have been getting interest back from colleges, uh, I would be improper to not mention uh, Davon Bomar. He's number uh, 48 for us, defensive end. He, he thinks he's a tight end sometimes as well, but we use more on defensive end uh, aspects of it. He has a few um, uh, Division One offers, uh, Morgan, uh, you know, uh, Delaware State. Uh, he just got one from uh, University of New Hampshire. Nice. Uh, so he, he's picking up, um, you know, more offers as things go along. He's he's an explosive guy. Um, other than that, you know, uh, our running back who actually did get injured in inside of the uh, uh, John Carroll game, uh, Hunter Haruz, uh, not a necessarily a Division One talent, but a really a uh, good mover in space, has great vision, uh, interested in like a Salisbury Division Three type of, uh, of game and, and has, they've shown interest in him as like a slot kind of receiver type of kid. Um, defensively, we, we have a bunch of kids that are, are really, uh, I, I would say, playmakers for us but don't necessarily want to move on and play. And I think that's one of the things that we attempt to instill in guys as well is that understanding of you know the difference between collegiate level football mm -hmm. and what we are it becomes something that is we are about relationships and you know m being a family not saying that it can't happen at the collegiate level but the level of expectation is so much greater on the football aspect of it so if you're going to move on and play football at co in college you have to love that game and some of our guys love being with their their boys and play very hard for them might not see themselves at that next level. But uh, those would be the two, two guys that I would say just off, off the cuff um, that are, are pretty solid guys for us. Have there been past players, you've been here nine years, have yes, there been sir. past players that have gone on to the collegiate level and have, have you tracked them, kept the fatherly uh, figure uh, eye on them uh, just to see how they're doing? Absolutely. Um, uh, we, we had a good relationship with uh, Mammoth uh, up in New Jersey. Okay. Um, and we, we've sent multiple offensive linemen there. Uh, a young man named Matt Stoneberg. I say young man, he's now in his mid-20s. but uh, Still you know, a young man. Yeah. <laughs> so, but uh, he, he was a starter for them for three years. Uh, we sent another offensive lineman there, uh, John Galena, 6'7", like two 80 type of kid um, who was a solid player for us. Uh, we just recently had a young man um, signed by uh, Dartmouth, um, uh, Keegan McHugh, who uh, went actually to a prep school uh, in Massachusetts for a year, uh, Deerfield, and then picked up by uh, Dartmouth afterwards. Um, and just the you know, same type of thing. Some, some of our kids are later bloomer types of guys where um, in their senior year, all of a sudden now they're getting film that is really positive. And a lot of times now because of social media and uh, all the you know technology associated with recruiting, uh, it's so front end loaded. If you're not good as a, a sophomore and a junior, a lot of times a lot of those scholarships for Division I programs, bigger Division I programs are gone by the time you become a senior. If you're a late bloomer and you come in your senior year, and you don't already have film, it's kind of tough to, to get someplace. Yeah, it's difficult to really project the growth of these kids, both mm -hmm. mentally and physically, and how they adapt to the next level. Absolutely. So that's an interesting story. Now, with respect to the NFL, we've seen them focus a lot on safety, player safety. Mm -hmm. And 
the effects of how they have to coach, they're changing the way tackling has to be done mm -hmm. and whatnot. Has that filtered down to the high school level and the way you conduct your program and teach and coach kids? A absolutely. Uh, I mean, there there's definitely been uh, anybody that is out there listening that is a uh, old football coach. Uh, tackling wise, it used to be get your head in front, because right? then he's got to run through your whole body to be able to you know, continue making yards. And we used to talk about getting your head across as a defensive coordinator. Now that's, that's not the way that it is. You put your head behind to take your head out of the tackle, and it almost becomes that hawk tackle or you know, seahawk tackle, however they want to refer to it in NFL terms. I've, I've seen it referred to a lot of different ways. It becomes that rugby style where you're wrapping up at the knees and kind of pulling in and you know, taking them down low in a lot of cases. We've changed uh, vastly what we do with that. Uh, obviously, the concussion protocol stuff now is much longer than it ever was before. You get, had a guy that got his bell rung mm -hmm. in the, you see, three or four Just plays. Just get back oh, in yeah, there, yeah, right? You'll be fine. You'll be fine. You know, that, that is not the case at all. In fact, we, we very often have take helmets and we have coaches carrying around somebody's helmet if they've taken a because they want to get until, back in the game until they're until the trainer says that they are okay and usually that that takes a you know extended period of time before we go those are things that have to happen and, it, and it's right I mean you know, I, for anybody that you know doesn't believe that those types of things are those types of changes are, are positive changes uh, we always talk about risk versus reward, you know, and, and the, the risk is way too great to, to look at the reward of playing a couple more plays inside of a game that, you know, it might affect you for the rest of your life. Absolutely. Now, with the science that's at hand, people are becoming more aware of CTEs and brain trauma and things of that nature. Have you seen, let's say, a watering down of the athletic talent in the football pool, so to speak. In other words, mm -hmm. have parents redirected their athletic kids to take on other sports because of the fears of the long-term implications of CTE and brain, brain trauma? Uh, the problem would be with that question, Ada, is for the high school coach, I usually don't see them until they are interested in playing force. Have okay. we had guys that have come out and then left the program afterwards yes if we're talking about you know total number of people uh, my first couple years when we had uh, guys coming out for the program we were probably upwards of around 100 to 115 guys this year we are only suited up around 90 so it total just math wise now whether or not this was a you know a low bubble in guys that were interested mm -hmm. in playing or whether or not that is the cause of it tough to say but um, it hasn't really happened that often for me to you know, say that it is a, a hundred percent a causation of being afraid of concussions. Um, there are guys that we talk to in the hallway that are just, you know, we have got a ton of humongous kids walking around this school that don't play football. And that is an answer that I get from, from some of them, but I don't know if it was that they never were interested in it or if it was just a, a way to say to the head football coach, no, I'm not, I'm not coming out. <laughs> right. What would you say to the parents out there that are thinking about or on the fence about whether to let or encourage their kid to play football, you know, because of all the things they're hearing from the NFL and trickling down? Yeah, uh, I, w I would revert back to what I had said earlier about football. I, is I, I believe that it is the ultimate team sport. You get taught. There's so many more lessons that I believe happen on a football field, um, not only the, the ones of teamwork and unified effort and all that kind of stuff, but it also might be one of the most humbling games that you can play as well is where we defensive linemen, sometimes your job is not to make the tackle. It is to get manhandled by two guys eating up a double team and get driven back and lay, laid on your back and then get up and do it again for no reward whatsoever other than I did my job. You know, that, and it, it, I think it teaches young men to be able to put themselves aside every once in a while and look at the greater good, which is something that I, I don't see happening in, again, I'm a now 19 year teacher. Uh, it's very difficult to talk to high school age kids and have them say, put your ego aside and look at the whole situation of what's happening, what's best for everyone here. And football allows you to do that and have conversations with kids that want to be there to 
learn that lesson, basically. You know, yeah, the game is the background of it, and everybody wants to be a star, but when it comes down to it, that is the lesson that they're going to get. You know, whether they want to or not, it's coming for them. Life lessons within the game. Thanks for joining us, Dave. Absolutely. This is the Harvard Sports Report. We'll be right back. I realize that I'm not perfect, but it all really started to change because you judge me for having a problem. No one is going to know that I need help. I need help. I know that no one is going to judge me for having a problem. I realize that I'm not perfect, but it all really started to change because you listen. I'm here with Coach Seiler, Coach Darren Seiler of the John Carroll Patriots here at John Carroll Field for the Josh Hamer Memorial Tournament. Second year, the untimely death of Josh Hamer two years ago in a car crash on his way to John Carroll. A uh, great student athlete and uh, a terrific cause. Coach Seiler, what's, what's the tournament all about? Uh, first of all, I want to thank you guys for coming up and uh, giving us the opportunity to talk about the Hamer Tournament and uh, some of the Hamer events that we have going on here at John Carroll. Um, after Josh's passing, um, I mean, he was a larger than life figure here on campus. Great student, fantastic athlete. Um, last year we began uh, the, the, the foundation or the scholarship fund for him. Uh, two seniors, Ryan Archibald and Grant Astle, began uh, the process. It's since become a legacy project. Uh, we hold a tournament for 13U and 14U players every year uh, here at John Carroll. And we also have a home run derby. We call it Homers for Hamer. Um, it's an opportunity for us as a community to kind of collectively heal, to come together in solidarity, to have a legacy program for Josh that we always remember him, number 25. Uh, and it's, it's also a way for these young men that are seniors. This year it's uh, Brandon Cruz, Stelio Stachius, and Hunter Tipton uh, have, have kind of taken the project on as their senior project as a graduation requirement um, and, and are putting on these events to, for us as a community to uh, to honor Josh and to continue his legacy here. So uh, we're extremely grateful for them uh, taking this on. And who participates in the tournament uh, that, uh, that happens? This year we have, uh, we had five 13 U teams and it looks like gonna be at least seven 14 U teams. And they're from all over the state of Maryland. We had a Pennsylvania team and a Virginia team come up as well. So uh, the Mid-Atlantic all is uh, being a part of this and supporting us in the cause and we're really grateful for them to come. And then on the second weekend, there's a home run hitting contest, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and who participates there? So that's players and uh, old uh, alum that come and uh, community members, people in the school, outside the school, a lot of the MIAA teams that knew and respected Josh and uh, know us as a coaching staff are going to be here. Uh, a lot of the youth teams and programs are going to be here. I know Havity Grace is going to be here. Um, there's some Bel Air, Hickory. Um, you've got some larger blue chip organizations uh, that are all going to be coming out. Uh, we're probably going to have, uh, you know, maybe some, some guys, former pros coming out. Uh, Melvin Morris said he's probably going to come up and uh, take some swings and, and be around to sign autographs. So uh, it's, it's a pretty wide swath of the community, uh, either through the connection to the school or people from Rising Sun, for example, that knew Josh and they're going to come. That's great. Maybe uh, my co-host, Tony Lombardi, played for Curly back in the day. Maybe we can drag him up here on Saturday to hit a couple of... Uh, Dingers out of the park. You know, I've, I've heard great things about his swing, and I think he's still got some uh, that he can come out and give us a few. So hopefully well, he'll come up and give us some swings. We'll make some great highlights for our, <laughs> for our session. Well, thank you, Coach. We're going to have two of the, the three players that yeah. uh, are involved in the program this year when we, when we come back, and uh, thank you for your time. Hey, Larry, I really appreciate it. Thank right. you so much. Thank you. I'm joined now by two of Josh's uh, tight teammates uh, here at John Carroll, uh, Brandon Cruz and Stelio Stakis. Uh, uh, these fellows uh, keep this uh, tournament uh, going in the second year. Fellas, tell us what it's all about. Brandon? Um, I feel like that remembering Josh is the only purpose, but I feel like bringing a community together and remembering him, um, raising money for the Josh Amber Scholarship, and it's just, I think it's mostly a part of remembering Josh and making sure he's still with us every single day in, in this John Carroll community. Excellent. How about you, Stelios? What's your feelings? Uh, Josh had a really strong legacy, and uh, he touched a lot of people. So we're trying to like live that through. And uh, a lot of his friends and teammates, like me and Brandon, we really cared about him, and we're just trying to make sure people remember the kind of person he was. Excellent. I think it's an awesome effort that you guys do. Also, it's part of a senior project here at John Carroll. What's right. that all about? Um, 
basically it's a senior project that we have to raise money for something and ours is just to raise money for that Josh Hammer Memorial Scholarship that we give out one every year. There's two players right now on the baseball organization that do have this scholarship and we're very honored to have those two players on the team. Excellent. And uh, you get to participate if you want. You going to participate in the home run contest? Most likely, yes. I don't know if I'll hit any home runs, but... How about you, Stelius? going to ding some for us? Come and find out. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. It's the John Carroll Josh Hammer Memorial Tournament here at uh, John Carroll Field. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Great story on the Josh Hammer piece. Joining us now on the Hartford Sports Report, you know him from 105.7 The Fan, and also as a Hartford County resident, Scott Garceau. Scott, welcome that? in. I'm home. I'm you home. Are home. Yeah. <laughs> Good it's, to be in Hartford County. Earlier yeah. in the program, Scott, we talked to Dave York from Bel Air High School. He's the head football coach for the Bel Air Bobcats. And one of the things we talked to him about was head trauma and how it's affecting the way high school coaches coach up their, their kids. So I, I just wanted to get your feeling on the NFL in terms of how they're managing this and how you think it's impacting the game right now. Well, I, I think we've we've seen the rule changes, and it's legit. What what do the owners have to pay seven hundred and some million dollars right. uh, over settling a lawsuit with former players, and um, that's where the rule changes have come to make the game safer. Uh, we know some things now. I think we're going to know a lot more in ten to fifteen years, and uh, youth participation is down. I think parents are. You know, when when, when you and I were growing up. Maybe you had to talk mom into going out for the football team. Now you might have to talk mom and dad going out. But, uh, you know, the, the rules on the quarterback are a little different. I think uh, the NFL understands that the quarterbacks move the needle, whether it's Brady or Rodgers or Drew Brees, superstar quarterbacks move the TV needle. Um, they want to keep those guys in the game. So I don't think that's so much CTE, but the hits over the middle, the defenseless receiver, that's all CTE head trauma related and I think it's a good thing the game is different and people say oh, put skirts on them but if you watch NFL football on Sundays there's still enough hitting to go around to make it a, a, a good game yeah it, it is an adjustment period and I think that the NFL will tweak this and fine-tune it to where it's a comfortable medium for both safety yeah. and the fans we'll go back and look at highlights of night train lane just clotheslining players and that was legal and Johnny <laughs> Unitas basically getting punched in the face and that was legal at, Shoving at, mud up at his a time. Nose. <laughs> yeah right so we, we, we're constantly evolving but um, we found out over the last 10 years a lot of things about CTE and head trauma and it, it's it's real uh, you see a death of a junior Seau and some of the other players that have battled depression that could be related to CTE and um, it, it's a very important topic I think it's the biggest the biggest thing that the NFL faces as far as being the golden goose and being America's most favorite sports TV ratings, that I think over the next 25 years will, will determine the future. The NFL is not going away, but it may not be as popular as we've seen it over the last 25 years. As we wind down this episode of the Hartford Sports Report, wanted to give you some highlights in high school sports. The Varsity Sports Network ranks the Metropolitan teams, and right now in girls' volleyball, the Bel Air Bobcats, number 10 with a 12-1 record. Next up for them is Patterson Mill to end out their season. Uh, in girls' field hockey, C. Milton Wright ranked number 4 in the polls uh, at 11-1. At number 13 is North Hartford at 10-1, and, and number 15 is Bel Air 9-3. In boys soccer, number five, C. Milton Wright ended their season with a 10-2 record, waiting for the playoffs now. Number 15 was Patterson Mill at 8-3, and, and number 16 was Bel Air at 9-4-1. In football, Edgewood, number 15 with a 7-1 record. Next up for them is Havity Grace. Girls soccer, number 11 is Bel Air at 9-3-2. John Carroll, number 18, uh, at a 7-5 record, they'll play in the IAAM playoffs. Number 20, Falston, at 7-5, also waiting for their playoff spot. Also, lastly, the Bill Brown cross-country series. Bill Brown was a Hartford County resident and in 1951, won the gold medal in the Pan American Games in cross-country in the 800-meter uh, run. Uh, he was also NCAA champion at that time. Today, there's a run that for all kids of all ages and a series of runs that caps off on the 28th of October uh, at Tollgate Park. You can find out more about 
the run and the run series at Harford, runharford.com. That's it for our, our program for this month. For Tony Lombardi, I'm Larry Dukes, and this is the Harford Sports Report. We'll catch you next month.